When Newfoundland and Labrador came into the early post-war period as a newly confirmed province of Canada, it was known as a land where there were a few small tramp steamers, some tall-masted ships that still fish the Grand Banks, a lot of whales, and many hardy fishermen who braved the rough Atlantic in small boats and brought back cod, the historic base of the province's economy, to land their cod where their homes clung precariously to cliffs that overhung the sea. Few men at that time realized Newfoundland's great potential, and fewer still dreamed that today's Newfoundland would ever come into being. Things moved slowly in the sleepy villages then, and the Newfoundland Hotel was the province's only impressive building. Newfoundland and Labrador were little known to the world at large, and the most ambitious people were leaving for what seemed like a better future elsewhere. The province was not judged to be an island of opportunity. A few knew the inner beauty of the great wild areas that were inaccessible to all save the trappers, the prospectors, and the foresters who sometimes traveled the remote areas. Or to the sportsmen who hunted the graceful caribou stags on the fall barrens. Or sought the magnificent moose. Or fished for the leaping salmon. But with Confederation and a new government in 1949 came a new life, a new determination, a new will to build a great province out of the old languishing ex-colony. Overnight, the men, the machines, and the money went to work. Building roads, building airstrips in the wilderness, building schools and hospitals and factories, and harnessing the wasted power of the magnificent rushing waters. The prime project in this age of developing power, where electricity is the key to both modern production and modern living comfort, was Churchill Falls, a roaring, tumbling, awe-inspiring torrent of water with a power potential far greater than Niagara's. An almost unknown falls on a great lonely river that swept from the Labrador Highlands to the sea through an endless, unbroken wilderness. The ideas, the men, the machines, the will to build, all were crystallized into a great effort that overcame all obstacles, both physical and political, to harness and tame the Churchill's raging flow. The power potential of the province's water resources is being developed wherever it exists. And Newfoundland is moving into the electronic era with a great wealth of the power nature's swift flows bestow. The plans are drawn. The contracts are let on a project that will cost more than one billion dollars. The work begins. From the measuring stage through the actual work period, as many as 7,000 people are involved here in making a great dream come true. A dream to send millions of horsepower of electricity out from the site to light the lamps and turn the wheels required by today's society. Mountains of earth and over three million cubic yards of solid rock were moved to prepare the site. For a suitable continuous water source, the Headwaters Lake had to be expanded to an area of 2,700 square miles, creating one of the world's largest man-made lakes. 
a body of water more than one half the size of Lake Ontario with a shoreline of roughly 3,000 miles. This gigantic power development will harness the energy of the vast watershed by diverting these waters from the 245 foot drop at Churchill Falls. A series of tunnels at the power site create a drop four times the height of Churchill Falls and six times the height of Niagara Falls, capturing and taming an almost unbelievable source of power in the powerhouse 1,000 feet underground. The surging wires of transmission carry electricity wherever the province needs it and to the world beyond. Twin communities of Wabush and Labrador City, a great working complex sprang into being in the remote wilderness, complete with airstrips, a railroad, a highway, and all the schools, homes, administrative buildings, and mills to house 10,000 people and to produce two-fifths of all of Canada's iron ore. Great machines uncover iron ore that has rested there untouched for centuries. Others carry it on its way to be fabricated into the steel that is the basic support of our society and its industry. From dream to reality is a long, hard road. In every major industrial development, there must first be the plans and the models. Miniature dreams that will become magnificent in reality. The phosphorus plant that is this dream's reality required 80,000 cubic yards of concrete and cost $45 billion to build and has the largest phosphorus furnaces in the world. It is now producing some 60,000 tons of elemental phosphorus a year, with a staff payroll of 450 men and women. Over 150,000 horsepower in electricity is required for the work. It also necessitated the development of a local silica mine and the expansion of Newfoundland's production of lime. Two ships were built to carry 5,000 tons of phosphorus per loading to the international market. The first specially built phosphorus carrying ships in the world. And this also necessitated the development of deep water port facilities. The product of this industry is used not only in fertilizers and metal treatment processes, but also in the manufacture of food products detergents, and many other industrial and consumer items. The blanketing softwood forests, one of the province's major natural resources, are being made to produce greater wealth and productivity than ever before. New mills and new products steadily increase Newfoundland's position in the fields of newsprint, fiberboard, and other wood products.
to protect this great resource and the lives and homes of the people who live adjacent to the forest, one of the most efficient firefighting forces in the world has come into being. The record of damage by forest fires in Newfoundland and Labrador is now so low that it no longer constitutes a serious problem. And the constant patrols continue to safeguard the future. Newfoundland's network of roads and superhighways have transformed the province, opening up the interior areas that were, save for some logging camps, a complete wilderness. Now, highway construction crews work endlessly, season after season, with the same energy and capacity that boosted Newfoundland's paved roads from just over 100 miles in 1949 to more than 1,200 miles today. There has been a similar increase in the development of secondary roads. A total highway network of more than 5,000 miles now connects practically every settlement with the central traffic stream. Highway transportation now brings life and vitality swiftly and efficiently to cities and towns that would still be empty bush country without it. Newfoundland's history for centuries after its discovery by John Cabot in 1497 was the history of the sea surrounding it. Today, scientific study stations work endlessly to learn the sea's secrets and search out its wealth. At the town of Boswarlow's on the Porta Port Peninsula, in the first plant of its kind in Canada, a sea mining operation extracts magnesium from the salt water in the form of magnesium hydroxide. Seawater is treated with sulfuric acid and hydrated lime. 350 tons of lime are burned every 24 hours, day after day, week after week, in continuous operation to produce 164 tons of magnesium hydroxide daily and provide additional employment for the province's growing labor force. Ships, and especially fishing ships, have always been dear to the hearts of all Newfoundlanders. For centuries, they built their wooden boats on the beaches. Now, in this age of steel, they have a shipyard that can build steel ships of up to 1,000 tons, of the type that best suit their local conditions, and can service and repair vessels of much greater tonnage. Following Confederation, Newfoundland and Labrador leaped into a period of great construction, filling its needs and its dreams with all the materials and know-how of a world that is everywhere a building. Leaving its slow and quiet past behind it. Building faster than the world around it. Leapfrogging ahead to build for its needs to come. Playing a major part in the construction program is a major steel mill producing essential components for the growing industrial needs of the province and contributing to the needs of the rest of Canada and to Canada's export market.
The tall buildings rise high, stand stark and strong, aimed at the great new future. Millions of board feet of lumber and a mountain range of sand and gravel have been moved and merged with endless carloads of cement, countless steel beams into millions of tons of useful construction. These materials have been worked and welded into the necessary offices, commercial factories and residential buildings to help make the growing economy continue to expand. of the major construction efforts is Memorial University. This may be Newfoundland's greatest leap into the future. To keep abreast of expanding requirements, the university has grown from a small college to an enviable position among the top-ranking universities of the nation, with an enrollment of more than 6,000 enthusiastic students, and is still growing. The island of Newfoundland, located strategically at the junction of the Gulf Stream and the Labrador Oceanic Flow, is ideally situated to study the sea and to aid in developing techniques to use and conserve its resources. The great reserves of timber make it a logical seat for the special study of northern forests, where wise use and conservation will be of maximum importance. And while Memorial specializes in the sciences of the sea and the forest, it is a university with an interest in every facet of education and understanding. It will endow with learning the engineers, the doctors, the teachers, the lawyers, and all the professions, both for the needs of the province and for the expanding world of science and technology. Not overlooked are the arts, the symbols of man's dreams, the paintings, the literature, the folk songs, and the symphonies. All the activities that, in the minds of many, are the heart and soul of man's life on earth. The universal building boom is nowhere more apparent than in Newfoundland's great expansion in the building of homes. Wherever there is work to be done or pleasure to be derived from living in new surroundings, ground is being broken. Foundations set, service facilities installed, and thousands of suitable types of attractive houses are constantly being built. Cities and towns seem to have changed overnight from listless groupings of drab dwellings into fresh, bright, modern communities. with modern building techniques. A growing share of the newest, most up-to-date homes in Newfoundland are prefabricated. They are built at a construction center 
and then moved over the network of highways and located on the chosen site. Modern apartment houses replaced the old rows of block houses. Now, in Newfoundland, a traveler finds the clean and comfortable motels that make today's traveling both easy and pleasant. And the visitor from far away finds the same catering to worldwide tastes he'll find in the major capitals of the world. Typical old-fashioned stores have been replaced in the large communities by bright, deficient supermarkets and specialty shops of all types. The best of the materials of worldwide trade find their way to these modern markets. In spite of the pressing need for continuing new construction, the best of the old things of lasting form and timeless beauty still stand to give depth and dimension to the province's future. The harbor of St. John's, once a mecca for sailing ships and lesser vessels of international trade, has been transformed into a sleek, efficient port of call for the merchants and fishing fleets of most of the world's maritime nations. St. John's itself is a world port of major importance and is the government center for the province of Newfoundland and Labrador. The heart of the provincial administration is centered in the beautiful Confederation building which stands on a hill overlooking the city and its harbor. As with higher education through its Memorial University, Newfoundland, since Confederation with Canada, has made a great advance in universal education at the lower levels. With the literacy almost completely eliminated, Newfoundland's standing has jumped from among the lowest in Canada to one of the best. The general growth and modernization of the province has not left religion behind. But rather, religion has led the growth. Perhaps more than elsewhere, the religious spirit has prevailed in guiding the province in its new direction. And new churches to match the strength and purpose of this new age of man's development are continually being erected. of Memorial University's chapels to the Confederation building is but a short distance. The two are as close, perhaps, as the spiritual guidance of Newfoundland's people is to the driving decisions they make through a provincial government that has lifted them from the swamps of despair to a new high plateau of achievement, with their eyes on the even higher goals of the future.